Welcome, everyone. We're about to get started. Glad to see so many of you guys here. A welcome to A Battle of Wills, a discussion of free will with professors Dennett, Green, and Pinker. I'm Richard. And I'm Jennifer. And we're the co-chairs of the Harvard Society for Mind, Brain, and Behavior. HSMBB is an undergraduate organization that is dedicated to sharing um, all the greatest and latest research and ideas in all things mind, brain, behavior um, across a variety of disciplines from computer science to linguistics, uh, to, from philosophy to the neurosciences. And we're really thrilled to see so many of you here today who are interested in MBB. Throughout the year, we put on seminars and teas um, that allow the public and undergraduates to talk with uh, the most prominent, some of the most prominent thinkers and researchers in mind, brain, behavior. And our semester culminates with a symposium, which you guys happen to be at. <laughs> um, Kara Wiseman, who's standing in the front, who deserves a major shout out. She's our symposium chair this semester, and she's worked tirelessly to organize this event today. She'll um, give an overview, as well as introduce a topic of free will and our esteemed speakers. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Kara, thank you Richard and Jennifer, and I am your symposium chair for today. So I just want to give you a brief overview of today's event and introduce our amazing speakers. So today's event is on the subject of free will, which is a topic that has been hotly debated for millennia by thinkers ranging from Democritus to Sam Harris. Contemporary debates on the subject have been informed in part by scientific developments and how they should be interpreted. Questions have included, is free will compatible with a naturalistic worldview? If so, do we have it? Or is free will an illusion that should be given up? And how should it affect our ideas of moral responsibility and our legal policies? We're absolutely ecstatic to have three truly exceptional speakers to discuss these issues and more today. For many, I suspect they need no introduction, but I have the honor of giving one anyway. Dr. Daniel Dennett is University Professor and Austin B. Fletcher Professor of Philosophy and the co-director of the Center for Cognitive Studies at Tufts University. Among many things, his work has addressed issues in the philosophy of mind, science, science and biology. He's the author of many books, including Consciousness Explained, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, and The Mind's Eye. Dr. Joshua Green is an associate professor of psychology at Harvard University. He leads the Moral Cognition Lab, a group dedicated to the study of moral judgment and decision making that has been profiled in Discover Magazine. He is also the author of the forthcoming book, The Moral Brain and How to Use It. Dr. Steven Pinker is a Harvard College professor and Johnstone Family Professor of Psychology. He conducts research on language and cognition, writes for pu publications like the New York Times and Time Magazine, and is the author of eight books, including The Language Instinct, The, Bl the Blank Slate, and How the Mind Works. Our format today is designed to promote an open and informative dialogue. The first part of the program will be introductory remarks from Drs. Dennett, Green, and Pinker in that order. This will be followed by a few minutes for each of our speakers to get their thoughts about what's already been said on the table in the same order as before, and then by a period of open dialogue between the three of them. Finally, we'll close with an audience Q&A directed by Dr. Pinker, and so I ask that you keep questions that might come to your mind during the event in mind to be asked then. Finally, I ask that you silence your cell phones now to not disturb others around you, and also the event is being filmed. And I ask that when the event is concluding around 5 o'clock that you exit promptly, because there is a class that meets in here at 5 o'clock and we need to have cleared out by then. <laughs> Harvard always classes. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Daniel Dennett for his opening remarks. <laughs> if we could get the first slide, that would be good. Now, come on. There we go. Okay. Um, hello. I'm going to push this button, I guess. Okay. Uh, Josh Green and Jonathan Cohen are the author of this paper, which I'm going to be talking about. Very influential paper published a few years ago in the Transactions of the Royal Society. For the law, neuroscience changes everything and nothing. It's a very subtle essay. And the main point of it is this. Although the law claims to be neutral regarding libertarian versus compatibilist accounts of free will, the folk intuitions grounding our current understanding of law are not neutral. That's my 
my take on what, it, what they're saying. And moreover, those folk intuitions are false. They're insupportable. The law must shed those intuitions. And those are the folk intuitions that we have about dessert, about just desserts, about, about whether or not anybody ever really deserves uh, punishment, or, or praise for that matter. And according to Green and Cohen, they depend on a false, insupportable view of our mind's brains. And retributive justifications of punishment depend on them. So uh, I'm not going to bother defining retributive here. It'll come out a little bit more if you don't already know. But at any rate, uh, what uh, Cohen and Green want to say is so much the worse for retributivism. And apparently, so much the worse for desert, for any concept of moral desert. That is a fairly radical conclusion to reach. So by their lights, we see we kill two birds with one stone. We banish mistaken folk intuitions about our minds. And this, in turn, permits us to banish retributivistic thinking about punishment. And this is a good thing. So this is a, a, an unusual paper in that it says that these folk intuitions uh, support the law. The law depends on people, everyday people, having these intuitions. And these are false intuitions. And this goes right to the heart of the, uh, is a real challenge to philosophy. Because just to take myself as an example, I put forward this compatibilist theory it shows how, how uh, the law and punishment and blame is all consistent with, uh, the, with modern science. And in effect, what they're saying is, even if I'm right, if the folk don't go along with it, if they have intuitions that completely, if I fail to convince the folk of my compatibilism, then this is a problem, because then the law is... is uh, uh, confounded with, uh, uh, is, is still hostage to false intuition. So this is, this is a difficult problem. Famous remark by the physicist Wolfgang Pauli, dissing the work of a colleague. He said, it isn't even wrong. <laughs> well, you can't say that about Josh Cohen's article. <laughs> I think both claims are misleading. No, I mean that actually as praise. I think m most of the work that's done in, in my field isn't even wrong. Uh, when something's wrong in a useful, clear, vivid way, that gives us an excellent springboard for further thought, and that's what I take this essay to be. Nevertheless, I think both the claims are misleading. It's a very valuable essay. It, it, it exposes important insights to the light. Now, I've learned from it. I've, I, I found that, first of all, we agree. It's very interesting that the three of us actually agree on a great deal. And there are many people in the field who don't agree with us at all. So there's a, there's a lot of shared agreement, which will probably come out in the course of the discussion. Um, and I had not, before reading uh, this paper, I had not fully appreciated th this particular challenge, which says philosophers may have their fancy, sophisticated theories which show how the law and, and free will and, and praise and blame are compatible with, with science, but we have to consider whether they can convince every man of that, and if not, we still have a serious problem. So what I claim is this. The first, the difference between sane consequentialist and mild retributivist thinking about punishment is vanishingly small. Green and Cohen think, let's get rid of retributivism and let's be good consequentialists, and that's a great, that's a great benefit for everybody. And I think, in fact, that's... that's misleading, that's illusory. If you do it right, the two views merge almost exactly. I'll try to show how. 
But more important in some ways, I think the folk intuition about responsible minds doesn't depend on minds being what, what they call uncaused causers. By their lights, people think that their will can't be free unless, I mean, they, they can't be held responsible, they can't deserve punishment unless their will is free in a contra-causal libertarian sense. And I think the evidence that that's what people believe is actually pretty slim on the ground. I'm going to try to show why. This is what they say. Seeing something as an uncaused cause is a necessary but not sufficient condition for seeing something as a moral agent. Okay. Now, might pause and ask later whether you're saying that that's what the folk believe or that's what you believe. Uh, not entirely clear how you stand on that. But in any case, they offer a thought experiment designed to reveal this very fact, to, to support this view that, to quote them again, seeing something as an uncaused cause is a necessary but not sufficient condition for seeing something as a moral agent. So they have a thought experiment. It's called The Boys from Brazil, inspired by the not very good science fictional film about the, the mad scientists in Brazil who are making Hitler clones. So here's their variation on the theme. Let us suppose then that a group of scientists has managed to create an individual calling Mr. Puppet, who by design engages in some criminal behavior, say a murder done during a drug deal gone bad. That's it, that's the thought experiment right there. Now this is what they say about it. Yes, he's rational as other criminals. Yes, it was his desires and beliefs that produced his actions, but those beliefs and desires were rigged by external forces. And that is why, intuitively, he deserves our pity more than our moral condemnation. That's what they want to show, that Mr. Puppet deserves our pity more than our moral condemnation. They go on. What's the real difference between us and Mr. Puppet? One obvious difference is that Mr. Puppet is the victim of a diabolical plot, whereas most people, we presume, are not. But does this matter? The thought that Mr. Puppet is not fully responsible depends on the idea that his actions were externally determined. That's what they say. The fact that these forces are connected to the desires and intentions of evil scientists is irrelevant, is it not? What matters is only that these forces are beyond Mr. Puppet's control, that they are not really his. Thus it seems that in a very real sense we are all puppets. The combined effect of genes and environment determine all of our actions. Mr. Puppet is exceptional only in that the intentions of other humans lie behind his genes and environment. Now, I have highlighted this, we are all puppets, because this is a favorite bugbear of mine. Uh, Sam Harris carries the same theme a little further in the very cover of his book on free will with the puppet strings and says at one point that the compatibilist, that is somebody with a view like mine, is somebody who says you're free as long as you love your strings. Um, and actually, I've been arguing against this for years. In a, way back in 84, I had a chapter called Please Don't Feed the Bugbears. Uh, the nefarious neurosurgeon is a character that enters into a lot of thought experiments. You notice how it enters into Green and Cohen's. They have a team of neurosurgeons. And these always depend on being secret. The victim doesn't know that this surgery has been perpetrated on him. And why should this be? In fact, the answer lies way back in the 50s in von Neumann on Morgenstern's book, uh, The Theory of Games. What they point out is that once you have more than one agent in the world, once it's not just Robinson Crusoe, then the problem of being manipulated by the other agent arises and you want to, you want to uh, uh, protect yourself against the manipulation of other agents because then you get these feedback loops that requires game theory. You can't just rely on expected utility theory and probability because of the complications of the feedback. And this is actually a fundamental difference in the world when there's extra agents. So contrary to what Cohen and Green say, the fact that most of us aren't put in this position by manipulative other agents is a very relevant, it's very important. I'm gonna to try to show it. Now, 
I, I love the fact that when they trot this thought experiment out uh, in their paper, they have a footnote that says this. Daniel Dennett might object that the story of Mr. Puppet is just a misleading intuition pump. Well, they're right about that. <laughs> I do indeed object. <laughs> but they, undaunted by this reflection, lead with their chin and say, it seems to us that the more one knows about Mr. Puppet and his life, the less inclined one is to see him as truly responsible for his actions and consider our punishing him as a worthy end in itself. So they say, basically, in your face, Dennett, so I, here I am, and I'm going to say, I'm going to try to demonstrate, and actually I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to do this because I, I'm, I'm just finishing a book on intuition pumps, and this is going to be one of the exhibits in it. <laughs> And I don't have to make one up because you got one right here for me. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's take a little closer look at Mr. Puppet. Now, many years ago when Doug Hofstadter and I were first writing about intuition pumps, Doug came up with a great phrase. He says, when you're looking at an intuition pump thought experiment, you always want to turn all the knobs. Now, basically what that means is just Mill's method of differences. You want to vary the conditions of the thought experiment and see what's actually doing the work. Because maybe it isn't what you think is doing the work. So this is an exercise in turning the knobs on Josh's thought experiment. You ready? OK, so here it is. I already read it to you. Now the first knob that I want to change is this getting rid of this group of scientists. I've already told you why. So I'm going to replace a group of scientists with an indifferent environment. It's not supposed to make any difference according to them. OK. So now we've got that. Suppose an indifferent environment has managed to create an individual. But now we have to get rid of the by design, of course, because the indifferent environment is not doing any designing. It's not an intentional agent. So, but we want to get some of the flavor of that, so we'll replace that with, with high probability. OK, so turn two knobs. Is it changing your intuitions at all yet? A little bit, maybe? Well, there's more to come. Um, I want to change the crime here from a drug deal gone bad to cover up an embezzlement. Shouldn't make any difference, still a crime, still cause to do it, da 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 da. Okay, so that's one more change. Now, there's one more change I want to make, and it, ca it can't be important because I just want to change the name. Oh, what should we call him? Hi, why don't we call him Captain Autonomy? <laughs> <laughs> now let me tell you a little bit about Captain Autonomy. You want to you, you get, get a little more detail. So here's my telling of their story with Captain Autonomy uh, playing the role. You ready? He majored in economics at Harvard. <laughs> he was a member of the Porcellian Club where he learned all sorts of lazy ethics. He went to work at Lehman Brothers. <laughs> where all around him people were cheating. He fell in love with a gold-digging heartbreaker who threatened to leave him. He saw his chance, almost surely an invisible crime. He was going to embezzle several million dollars. Oh, and he was going to give a million of it to charity. And just as he was about to do this, unfortunately, uh, the custodian saw what he was up to, and the custodian saw that it was illegal and threatened to blackmail him. And unfortunately, the custodian was standing in front of a ledge in a high-rise building, a little push, and oops, over he went. So that's the crime that Captain Autonomy committed. Three minutes. OK, I'll, I'm only going to get through one part of this thing. So Captain Autonomy, does he deserve our pity more than our moral condemnation? Does, have your intuitions been pushed at all? It seems to me they may have. Do your intuitions agree with, with Josh Cohen's? Now the question is, this, some, one of my students said, this is just dirty pool. You're just replacing his details with details which are designed to bring out the vindictiveness in us. Well, OK. But what it really is is this bad philosophical method on both of our sides. The thought experiment shouldn't depend either on your hatred of Lehman Brothers or, or on the details that Josh and Jonathan put in. But there's another knob I want to turn. They say, those beliefs and desires were rigged by external forces, and that's why da-da-da-da. Well, why the word rigged 
instead of caused. I think this is also very important, and they glide right over it. So imagine this. I'm in the supermarket shopping for cereal, and here's three scenarios. The first one is that my doctor has told me that I really should eat bran blobs because they'll save my life. So I buy bran blobs. That's Here's another one. There's a gorgeous picture of Cameron Diaz on the box, and I buy it. Here's another one. There's a secret microchip transponder that tweaks my nucleus accumbens, and I buy it. Notice in the third case, it's, I'm being manipulated, really, in a sense, in all three cases. But it's secret manipulation in the third case. I can fend off Cameron Diaz, oh, if only. Uh, but, but, but secret microchips is something else indeed. And a lot of the thought experiments depend on this. If the causation is, is transparent to you, if you're caused to buy the cereal because your doctor said it was a really good idea and you believed him, that's not anything you don't want to happen. OK. Still one more knob to turn. The further knob of secrecy, they don't ever ask, what happens if you tell Mr. Puppet the truth about his origins? Well, if he's as rational and, and composed as, as they say he is, he should immediately say, oh my goodness, that's terrible. I'm going to take steps right now to sequester myself in such a way that I never commit any crimes. Now, if he doesn't do that, of course, then he's not morally competent. His competence has actually been abridged somewhat by whatever these doctors have done for him. He isn't a full-fledged moral agent. He doesn't have the suppleness and, and reflectiveness that he should have. If Mr. Puppet has diminished responsibility, it's because he has diminished competence. So, okay, that's the first of the two claims I was going to make. And have I got any time left at all? One minute. All right, let me just, I, I'm not going to get to that second claim now. Maybe in the second round I will. Um, it depends on being a morally competent agent. Here's what Tom Wolfe has to say about it. Tom is always a good, he, he understands the zeitgeist even when he thinks it's right and it isn't. Here's what he says, the conclusion people out beyond the laboratory walls are drawing is the fix is in, we're all hardwired, that, and don't blame me, I'm wired wrong. Even Dilbert has picked up on this. Free will is an illusion. Humans are nothing but moist robots. Just relax and let it happen. That term, moist robots, has now entered my vocabulary. And it's very good. <laughs> because what I want to know is, well, Wolf says we're wired wrong. Well, what would it be to be wired right? Could you be wired right? And what would that take? Is there any way that a moist robot could be wired right that gave it responsibility? I think the answer to that is clearly yes. The mere fact of robothood or being caused has nothing to do with whether you're wired right. And the, and the fact that we're wired doesn't mean we're wired wrong. Uh, some are wired wrong, manifestly. They're, they're retarded or they're psychotic or they have some brain damage or something like that, and we excuse them. They're morally incompetent through no fault of their own. The rest of us are competent, lucky us. And that competence has nothing to do with whether indeterminism is true. And on that note, I will stop and not get to my next point. Thank you. <laughs> Switch this for you. Oh, you're going to plug yeah, in. Yeah, if I can. Uh, thanks. There we go. Do you use audio? Oh, no. It's not on. Uh,
Okay. Uh, well, first I want to say thank you to Kara Weissman and, and the other organizers for having me. It's really a, a, a great honor to be here and, and a little bit da daunting to be here with uh, two of the people who made me want to, to follow the career path that I, that, that I followed. Um, and if you're, if you're going to be raked over the coals by someone, it might as well be Dan Dennett and perhaps later Steven Pinker. Um, <laughs> So I, uh, I didn't know how much background uh, you, 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 you would get and how much intuition pumping or anti-intuition pumping you would get. So I'm, I'm going to start at the beginning and try to resist the temptation to have my initial presentation and rebuttal all rolled into one, but I'll, I'll do some things on the fly. This is the question that I want to try to answer or at least pose with, with, with some thoughts about it in this initial part. What happens when we banish the ghosts? So what do I mean by that? Uh, I think there are, there are two different kinds of free will in which one we can believe. You have what you might call the spooky kind, that's a technical philosophical term, and the natural kind. Uh, and uh, the spooky kind might be described as follows. It's the kind of free will that, uh, that, that you, you get to have if you are perhaps a, an immaterial soul or a mind independent of the body. And so its major, its defining features are that uh, the, the choices made by such a free agent, they're not fully determined by past events. Uh, they are produced by you, yourself, your soul, which is a kind of unmoved mover, that everything can happen right up to the moment of your decision, and nothing makes you choose other than you, yourself, in a self-contained way. As one philosopher put it, a tiny miracle occurs when you, when you make a decision if you have this kind of free will. And when you say that you could have done otherwise, what that really means is something quite strong, that you could have done otherwise with things exactly as they were, uh, and this is sometimes called, in, in, in philosophical jargon, libertarian incompatibilism, for the record. Now, on the other side, we have the natural kind of free will. Uh, and this is the kind uh, that, that comes from having the right kind of complex psychology, from being a certain kind of sophisticated, perhaps reflective agent. And this kind of free will is perfectly mechanical. Uh, is, 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 and, and, you can, and it can exist even if everything is completely determined by past events or that combined with random events. Uh, and this is, and the, the key idea here again is that what makes an agent free with this kind of free will is having the right kind of complex agentic psychology. And that when you say that this kind of agent could have done otherwise, that's equivalent to saying this agent would have done otherwise if things had been a little bit different, not quite as strong as the could in the other sense. And this is, as we said, known as compatibilism. This is the kind of free will that's compatible with everything that science has been telling us for the last few centuries. Now, uh, as, as, as Dan said, there's a lot of agreement here. I don't think any, any, any of the three of us believes in the spooky kind of free will. And so the question for us, and, and perhaps for you as well, is what happens when we banish the ghosts? What happens when we don't believe in that? And there are, of course, a range of, of, of views, a continuum. And at one end of the continuum, we have the view that nothing really changes at all. That when you stop believing in the ghost, when you stop believing in that special kind of free will that, uh, that, that, that we perhaps intuitively think that we have, nothing of substance really changes on, on the ground. And then at the other extreme, we have the view that if we don't have that, then life as we know it is over. Uh, now, I think it's pretty clear that Dan Dennett is over here, maybe all the way to the end, pretty close to the end. I would place myself somewhere here, especially if this is a logarithmic scale. Uh, that it is, I, I, that, that, that I'm a bit closer to the midpoint uh, than, than, than Professor Dennett. Now, I'm not quite sure what to say about Steve, but I think he'll probably be somewhere in this range. Uh, and you'll, of course, have to decide for yourself where, where you fall. Um, but the question now is why the gap between me and Dan Dennett, or the gap between me and Dan Dennett as I understand him, and as I've said, and as he said, it comes down to a certain aspect of our thinking about free will, and in particular how it bears on questions about punishment and responsibility. So to bring in these terms again, there are two general rationales for punishing people. The consequentialist rationale is we punish people in order to produce good consequences. And here, the main specific consequentialist reason is deterrence. So if you punish somebody, they're less likely to do in the future. Other people, if they know that you're, you're going to punish them, you've made an example of others, they're less likely to do bad things in the future. And that's the main forward-looking reason. We have good reason to punish because it will produce good effects down the road. And then we have retribution. And the idea behind retribution is really, it's quite simple and intuitive. It's that when people do bad things and they do it freely, they deserve to be punished. They deserve to suffer for what they did. And yes, doing that, punishing them may also produce these other benefits, but gosh darn it, it's right to stick it to them. It's just to give people what they deserve, independent of whether or not it produces 
uh, f future benefits. Um, and I think I want to highlight, because it's really retribution here that is my target. So uh, if you notice, retribution dropped out a, 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 in, in a lot of, of, of what Dan said. Uh, the idea is not that someone like our stockbroker uh, can't be responsible in some important ways, can't be worthy of punishment, and so on and so forth. The question is whether or not he and other people, whether you call them puppets or, or, or captain autonomy, uh, deserve this, whether retribution really makes sense. So why does banishing the ghosts matter? Well, I think the idea, here's the hypothesis, is that when we give up on the spooky kind of free will, this reduces the motivation, undermines retribution. It doesn't undermine all of responsibility. We still have the consequentialist motivations there. But it undermines something. Now, and, and I believe that this has real consequences for the real world. This is not just uh, an, an, an idle philosophical conclusion. Now, you can read this in two ways, and I want to read it both of these ways, one with more confidence than the other. First, as an empirical description. That is, as a matter of psychological fact, when people start to see other people as ultimately mechanical, that undermines the motivation to punish people retributively, to stick it to them when they do bad things simply because they deserve it. Not because it serves a, a, a good practical purpose, not because it promotes uh, good outcomes in the future, but simply because people deserve to suffer when they do bad things. And then there's the further question of, is it good, this tendency? And I'm, I'm, I'm more cautiously inclined to say, yes, it is a good thing. OK, so the two villains experiment, uh, the boys from Brazil experiment, you've, uh, you've already heard the punchline, so I won't drag it out. But you've got your evil scientist, or I think more appropriately, your evil engineer. It's always the scientists who are, who are getting the, the, the evil <laughs> appellation. Uh, it uh, has as a science project the villain, and he scours the world for genes that are likely to predispose the pers this, his people to uh, do bad things and lousy experience and so on and so forth. Uh, and, well, I'm just, I'm just curious. This is a dangerous thing to do, especially since you've already heard a, a forceful argument for the other side. When you think of this person who was born and bred and whose environment was created to make him do bad things, how many of you think that he is 100% fully responsible, as responsible as anybody for the bad things he does. Wow, don't see a lot of hands going up. How many of you think that he's at least somewhat less responsible than you might otherwise see him as being? A lot of hands going up. OK, well, then I must have asked the question incorrectly uh, if, uh, if, 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 if Dan is raising his hand. But the, 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 the thought is, uh, the problem is, is, is that your normal villain, so to speak, the one who you think it clearly deserves to be punished, so this is the guy who went to Harvard and engaged in embezzlement and threw the guy out the window and so on and so forth, can be effectively identical. And it's a question of what's in the background. And I think the, the and, and what's important here is that they can both be fully reflective characters. That is, uh, when, we, when, 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 we, when, we, when we specified these, these agents, the science project agent and the agent in the real world. We didn't say anything about there being simple-minded reflex mechanisms. This can be someone who quite reflectively endorses uh, let's say his own criminal, uh, criminal behavior. And, and uh, it's not clear to me that this person would change his mind if you said, I mean, well, it's my thought experiment. I'll say he wouldn't change his mind. Uh, that is, if you, if, if, if you tell them, by the way, you were raised by evil uh, neuroscientists, uh, biocultural engineers, to be the way you are, don't you want to change? And he said, to hell with that. I don't care. I just like, like living the life I live. Um, I don't think you'd get a change in behavior, as the author of this, of, of, of this thought experiment. Um, but my sense is that when you see this person as having been controlled by these outside forces, uh, there's not all of your sense of, 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 responsibility, of, 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 attribu of attributing responsibility to this person is gone. But something seems to go away. Um, we think of this person as a move mover. Now, that's a thought experiment, and we can twiddle some further knobs. I'll, I'll leave that to discussion. Now, I want to talk about a real experiment. And this was done uh, with uh, Azim Sharif and other colleagues. And the idea was to, to test this hypothesis that getting people to think of, uh, of, of, of human behavior in a mechanistic kind of way makes them less retributive. So we presented people with, uh, we, we presented people with uh, popular science articles describing experiments that remind you or tell you that, that ultimately human decision making is a, brain, uh, is, is a brain process, is a mechanical physical process. So this is one about an experiment in which a magnetic pulse oops to the brain, uh, 
ch causes people to change, their, the, change the decisions that they otherwise would make. Another one in which uh, a brain scanner is able to read people's intentions. And these are real experiments that people have done. Um, and then we gave people a scenario in which, uh, in which we describe someone who, who, who ends up killing another guy in a bar fight. And we say, OK, well, this person is definitely going into a treatment program and definitely getting a minimum sentence. And we specify as best we can that, this is, that the, the, the treatment program and the minimum s sentence are going to have all the deterrent effect that there is to be had. And the question is, how much extra punishment do you want to pile on top of this person in, in terms of a prison sentence? And does it matter if you've read the neuroscience articles before or not? And the answer is that it does seem to matter, that when people are just no philosophical, uh, no, no philosophical interpretation, just presenting people with the idea that human decision making is mechanical, this tends, as a psychological matter of fact, at least in this context, to make people more forgiving. And for reasons I mentioned, uh, it seems to be retributive punishment that is diminished in this experiment. So, as an empirical description, if you buy my, my interpretation of the thought experiment, and if you, and if you, and if you buy the results uh, or interpret the results of the experiment I just described, there's at least some evidence that thinking of human behavior as purely mechanical does indeed make people less retributive. Now, is that a good thing? Is this a normative prescription? Um, in the interest of time, I may have to cut this short. But I wanted to show you this film, which I take uh, oops, as a lovely illustration of, of unmoved movers. This is the famous Heider Simmel film from, from the 40s. Now I'm going to leave it at that because we're, 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 we're low on time. But what I want, the point I wanted to make is that when you look at that, you see that, 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 that triangle beating up on that other triangle. And I think you have a social kind of reaction to it. That is, you're not just seeing shapes on the screen. You have a sense that there are minds there, that there are agents there. And it provokes a kind of reaction uh, in you. Well, what is that reaction? And how does that kind of reaction fit into the overall architecture of the mind? So this is my favorite metaphor for the design of the mind overall. This is the, the camera that I got for my birthday a few years ago. And like many cameras, like many digital SLRs, it has these handy automatic settings. Uh, and it also has a manual mode. And the automatic settings are nice and efficient. They allow you to take good pictures, point and shoot most of the time. Uh, and manual mode allows you to do things that are fancier, that are more complicated. When you need flexibility rather than efficiency, that's what they're good for. And uh, this seems to be a general truth about how the, how the brain works. I, I highly recommend Daniel Kahneman's new book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which, uh, which develops these ideas in many different contexts. To take a familiar example, we have automatic settings that say, ooh, chocolate cake, that sounds good. But upon reflection, if we're dieting, if we think that all things considered, we're better off having the fruit salad instead, we can override that. Automatic settings versus overriding in manual mode. And what happens is we, we have automatic settings in, in response to unmoved movers in the social world. Uh, and I think that this is what's going on. This is the right way to characterize retribution and, uh, and, and, and deterrence. That deterrence makes sense in terms of, 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 of manual mode planning for the future. And that retribution is a kind of efficient mechanism. That is, we have a taste for punishment in the same way that we have a taste for chocolate cake. And sometimes it makes sense to eat chocolate cake, and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it makes sense to punish, and sometimes it doesn't. And so the idea is that a lot of punishment can be justified by good consequences. And a lot of punishment satisfies our taste for retribution. And most of the punishment that we end up doing falls in the middle here, where it's justifiable and it feels good. It tastes good, so to speak. Now, there's some that might be over here where it doesn't seem intuitively right, but it might make a kind of technocratic sense. The stuff that I'm really interested in is this part over here. Retribution, that is punishment that's intuitively satisfying, but that does not necessarily produce or that does not produce good results. Um, so this is, uh, the, the question is, does this really happen? Is this a problem in the real world? Uh, so this is, this is a quote from Michael Tonry, uh, a, a law professor and criminologist, uh, who says, uh, to address rising crime, American policymakers got lost in a forest of good intentions, public anxieties, and political cynicism. They created a punishment system that no one would knowingly have chosen, but that we do not know how to change. Current policies are too severe, waste money and lives, and often produce unjust results. They have produced an imprisonment rate, imprisonment rate five times higher than that of any other Western country. 
Now, why did this happen? Well, he, he takes a guess. Uh, policymakers in the 1980s and 90s ceased being interested in evidence of, what, uh, evidence of what works, of what foreseeable effects might be, because they were not primarily interested in crime reduction per se. The state, quote, and this is quoting a sociologist, uh, abandoned reason instrumental action and, and, and retreated into an expressive mode that we might describe as acting out, a mode that is concerned not so much with controlling crime as with expressing the anger and outrage that crime provokes. Uh, in other words, one way of, of looking at this is that we basically gave up or, or, or got too far away from the consequentialist justification for punishment and became kind of politically addicted to retribution. Now, I saw this in the newspaper this morning. This is uh, an article from, from, from Nicholas Kristof, published a couple of days ago, describing, uh, well, describing a new finding about veterans with PTSD. So the, the, he tells the story of a 27-year-old former Marine struggling to uh, adjust to civilian life after two tours in Iraq. Once a student, he now found himself unable to remember conversations, dates, and routine bits of daily life. He became irritable, snapped at his children, withdrew from his family. He and his wife began divorce proceedings, and he was diagnosed with PTSD. And then comes the revelation. His brain had been physically changed by a disease called cr chronic traumatic encephalopathology, or CTE. And a mother of a, of a similar uh, soldier uh, set, who sent two strong, healthy sons to Iraq, one committed suicide and the other is struggling, she said that it would actually be comforting to know that there might be an underlying physical ailment. When she, and this is, this is what really struck me when I saw this this morning. You're dealing with a ghost when it's PTSD, she told me a couple of days ago. Everything changes when it's something physical. People are more understanding. Now, what I want to ask is, is that a mistake? Is, under, is, 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 is being a bit more forgiving and, and understanding when you see something as ultimately physically caused, is that an error? Should we say we should think exactly the way we thought before? Or should we be thinking about this way uh, more thoroughly? And so. What I want to pr propose is that when we banish the ghosts, we become less retributive and more forgiving, as a matter of psychological fact. Uh, echoing the, the, the French proverb, to comprendre, je sais tout pardonner, to, to understand all is to forgive all. But with the important caveat that forgiving all in this sense doesn't mean giving up entirely on responsibility and punishment. There are still good forward-looking consequentialist reasons for holding people responsible and for punishing them, even if we don't view punishment as a worthy end in itself. And I'd like to suggest that this may be a good thing. Um, so this is sort of laying out the general view. And I, I hope that in the course of discussion, I'll have more of a chance to actually defend it. Um, but for now, at least, I hope you've gotten the general idea. So thanks, and looking forward to discussion. <laughs> When uh, Kara invited me to take part in this event, it was originally as moderator, which I thought was quite appropriate because unlike our distinguished, my distinguished co-panelists, I am not a philosopher, I'm not trained as a philosopher, and I really have no right to weigh in on, uh, on these issues. But uh, Kara and the rest of the Mind Brain Behavior Society asked if I would uh, take part as a participant. And I now think that it, it is a, a um, appropriate if you could imagine the sequence of the three speakers now in reverse. Um, a little bit like the Star Wars sequence where the story starts in the middle and then there are three prequels. Uh, I, have a, I have a hunch that many of you, though intrigued by the arguments that you've just heard, uh, may have come in with different questions about the nature of free will. The discussion that you heard sophisticated though uh, it is, I think presupposes certain uh, understanding of how we understand free will in a scientific context. So I'm going to start off with a prequel and lead you all to the steps where the debate that you've just heard begins. I'm then going to um, abuse my role as former moderator and uh, then, as in I believe the, the Star Wars uh, sequence then had a, a number of uh, movies that followed the initial sequence. I will have the other half of the sandwich. I will then 
give my comments on their debate, uh, relinquishing my turn in the, uh, the next round. So let me start off by uh, asking, what do we mean when we ask, is there such a thing as free will? And I think it really uh, is four different questions. The first is, is there an I, a self, a soul, a spirit who controls my behavior independently of the physiology of my brain? Josh uh, referred to that as the, the little miracle that takes place every time we make a decision. Is there no difference between knee-jerk reflexes and deliberate behavior? Is my behavior predictable, and can I be held responsible for my choices? And it's number four where uh, Dan and Josh begin their uh, disagreement. So is there a spirit separate from my brain? Uh, I think the consensus of pretty much uh, all scientists and the vast majority of philosophers is no. Uh, this is not a matter of faith, but is a consequence of uh, the discovery of modern neuroscience that as best we can tell, there is no mental event, no emotion, no perception that does not have a correlate in brain activity. Moreover, when uh, we affect the physiology of the brain directly, whether by transcranial um, magnetic st stimulation, surgery, uh, drugs, and so on, we can cause people's mental states to change as a result. Moreover, I would recommend to you a, a wonderful book by the uh, 2012 honoree of the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Harvard Secular Society, which was awarded a couple of days ago, Mary Roach, uh, whose book Spook outlines the scientific uh, search for the soul, the afterlife. Uh, when a person dies, does their weight decrease by an amount corresponding to the weight of the soul? Uh, if you have a seance, can you get Aunt Ethel from the great beyond to tell you which floorboard in the attic covers the trove of jewels she left behind? Uh, a lot of, uh, all the research suggests that the answer is no, that we are the physiology of our brains as an empirical discovery. Second, is there a difference between reflexes and deliberate behavior? If, uh, am I really like a puppet? And uh, the answer to that is no. There are responses that are uh, produced at a very crude first approximation by uh, impulses originating in the limbic system. We also have these massive uh, uh, cerebrums, the, including the prefrontal cortex, which can take in information from a variety of sources from memory and the environment, modulate behavior accordingly. We can call those processes free will, and the ones emanating from uh, more evolutionarily ancient parts of the brain, more uh, reflexive. Third, is my uh, behavior predictable? Would a uh, Laplacian demon who knew the position of every molecule in my brain be able to predict my choices completely? Including, uh, in, in a uh, uh, thought experiment, let's say I chose to defy the prediction of this evil demon or this superhuman intelligence, and I do something completely arbitrary or at random just to prove that I have free will. Well, this is a thought experiment that has been worked out in the comic strip Monty, uh, where he asks his roommate, the space alien Mr. Pi, what the heck is that? And Mr. Pi says, this is a prognosticator. It can predict the future actions of any individual. Monty says, that's impossible. Not really. You humans cling to your notion of free will, but actually, given enough data about an individual's psychology, past actions, etc., it's quite easy to predict future behavior. Oh, really? Is that so? Mr. Pi says, I'm afraid it is. If you'll excuse me for a minute. Mr. Pi reads the output of the prognosticator, goes into the closet, takes out an umbrella, because in the next scene, uh, Monty uh, attempts to prove that he has free will, that his results are completely unpredictable. Uh, in practice, behavior, of course, is, uh, can be unpredictable just because of the sheer complexity that there, uh, it would take Laplace's demon in order to trace out all the trajectories. There may also be uh, non-linear dynamics in the brain, chaos, so that anything short of infinite precision will uh, result in unpredictability in practice. And uh, for all we know, there may be quantum effects that are amplifi amplified by uh, Brownian motion of neurotransmitters or other processes that uh, make behavior unpredictable, even in principle, contrary to Mr. Pi. Now uh, we... Uh, 
having clarified uh, what I think most modern scientists and uh, a large m percentage of analytic philosophers conceive of as free will, this, the stage is now set for the debate that you've just heard between uh, Dan and Josh, namely, can I be held responsible for my choices? Uh, will we be, it's not just a matter of uh, thought experiments involving Mr. Puppet and the boys from Brazil, but many of you no doubt have seen, already seen headlines like uh, clues to a murderer's mind, changes in the brain could explain why certain people are more prone to kill than others, uh, man's genes made him kill, his lawyers claim, uh, and other such headlines. Uh, now, as uh, here I'm going to uh, give credit to Dan Dennett in his marvelous 1984 book, Elbow Room, The Varieties of Free Will Worth Wanting, in which Dan points out, and, uh, and this is uh, a matter that, that uh, I'm pretty sure Josh agrees on, the three of us agree on, is that a complete lack of predictability, uh, that is, uh, randomness in causation of behavior, is actually the last thing that we want if responsibility is to do what we want it to do, namely reduce bad behavior, since if a person was really unaffected by his surroundings and his past, he could simply be undeterred by the threat of punishment, blow off social sanctions or opprobrium, ignore twin, uh, twinges of guilt. What does it mean when we say we want to hold someone responsible? Well, it's not that we want their behavior to be random and unpredictable like, uh, like Monty, it's rather we impose contingencies of praise and blame, uh, a demand for compensation or restitution, the uh, demand for credible, uh, which means unpleasant remorse uh, if they're caught, and that they acquiesce to penalties, or if all that else fails, to criminal punishment, leading to the scenarios that uh, uh, Dan and Josh just explained. And as Josh pointed out, we do so in the hope that the contingencies will alter behavior in the future, the paradox being that then the desired consequence to the contingencies could be conceived of as a mechanical if-then rule implemented in the person's brain, namely, if I think I'm going to get thrown in jail for robbing a liquor store, uh, don't rob a liquor store. So the concept of responsibility is really a part of a policy of deterrence in a social language-using organism which don't appeal to any, uh, ultimately to any free will or soul in the sense of an uncaused causer, but to the, a part of the brain, presumably centered in prefrontal cortex, that can anticipate the likely consequences of behavior and inhibit it accordingly. And to a very good first approximation, and this might be the overlap between the two circles that Josh illustrated in his Venn diagram, what we think of as responsible uh, is very close to what, in fact, is deterrable. Uh, and in practice, we can see this in clear cases uh, where we do at least partly exculpate people. Uh, those happen to be exactly those circumstances in which they are least likely to be deterred by punishment after the fact. When uh, Dick Cheney uh, shot his uh, best friend, uh, he was not arrested or punished for aggravated assault. It was an unintended consequence, and hence uh, we don't hold him responsible, perhaps for negligence, but certainly not for aggravated assault. Why? Because, as we say, accidents will happen. Holding people responsible for accidents will not reduce the probability of accidents. Uh, someone betrays a... Uh, uh, colleague under torture, we don't find him as guilty because under the uh, anticipation of punishment is less likely to deter you from blurting something out under threat of torture. Uh, a delirious patient, a delusional madman. Uh, we don't hold children responsible because we believe that a contingency of holding children responsible is less likely to deter children. We no longer try animals. Uh, several hundred years ago, if a uh, boar would maul a child, for example, the boar would be uh, tried and uh, punished. Uh, we, don't hold, uh, we don't try inanimate objects. Again, this seems rather, uh, the possibility seems absurd, but in um, uh, ancient Athens, a, an ax that injured someone would be put on trial and hurled over the town walls if found guilty. We, <laughs> realize that that is pointless because doing so will not reduce the likelihood that axes will injure people. And we 
uh, punish people less for crimes of uh, passion than for premeditated murder because crimes of passion are exactly those which the threat of punishment are less likely to deter. Um, it suggests, and here I think this might be the, uh, the um, other wedge in Josh's Venn diagram, that uh, when we face borderline cases, cases where we have identified a deviant gene, a brain defect, someone under the influence of drugs, someone uh, who's had a bad upbringing, and so on, we, uh, rather than asking the question, did the person freely choose his behavior, we can ask the very similar question, and I, I think Josh would say the over, one with an overlapping answer, is that kind of person deterrable by a policy of holding people like that responsible? That is, does the person have an intact version of the human brain system that ordinarily responds to public contingencies of responsibility? Uh, now, now I'm going to switch. I think this. I, I hope that I've brought you up to the threshold of the debate that you heard uh, prior to my taking the microphone. Now I'm going to add my own comment uh, on uh, uh, both presentations, namely, what is this thirsting for abstract justice that we, uh, many of us, have, uh, and can it? How does it fit into the picture that ultimately? criminal justice system is a policy for reducing bad behavior. Uh, an objection to the kind of consequentialist or utilitarian justice that I've just gone through and that Josh explained is um, why would we pursue it when the deterrent value is dubious or not cost effective? Uh, say, why go after a 90-year-old Nazi war criminal tending his garden in Bolivia? Presumably, he is never going to be in a position uh, again to uh, perpetrate a holocaust. Uh, if there is some heinous but unique criminal, for example, where uh, through some never-to-be-replicated quirk he did what he did and therefore punishing him will not cause any similar person to take note and inhibit his behavior. What if the forensics and prosecutions are so uh, expensive that they exceed the cost to society that the criminal exacted? Uh, why would we? Why don't we just say, well, it'll cost more to prosecute him than uh, he stole. Uh, let just let him return what he stole, and society will be better off. Or, for that matter, have a pool that compensates the victims of crime that would save society money compared to the cost of prosecuting them. What is the objection uh, to that? Well, um, here I think is an answer, and I think this ultimately might uh, coincide with Josh's call for. Uh, a consequentialist system of justice, but it may be, as Dan uh, hinted, Daniel, you can clarify this, that as we pursue the uh, most consequentialist policy in exacting justice, we may end up with exactly what we call abstract non-utilitarian justice. That is, it could be that abstract justice in the long run turns out to be the best consequentialist policy. And the reason is that if we really carried out policies of punishment that were strictly designed to minimize the cost to society, then wrongdoers could game the system by figuring out exactly how much crime they could commit that it would not pay us to prosecute. And in fact, in the long run, virtually all punishment could fall in that category, rendering criminal justice useless. And this gets back to a, um, a paradox of the notion of punishment that very much relates to the body of theory that uh, Dan alluded to, the theory of games, uh, namely, what do rational <coughs> agents do when faced with other rational agents? <coughs> and punishment itself is paradoxical because, of course, after a crime is committed, punishment is really a form of spite. You are inflicting a second harm added on top of the first one in your desire for retribution. As they say about uh, capital punishment, it won't bring the victim back, but of course that is true of any punishment, including life imprisonment. Nonetheless, unless antecedently, a priori, you have the resolve to carry out the punishment, regardless of whether it's cost effective or not, its deterrent value falls to zero. Wrongdoers could, as they say, call our bluff. 
So the implacability of the intent to punish is essential to the logic of criminal justice to make it an effective deterrent. And so abstract justice might just be utilitarian or consequentialist ju justice in the long run, or a kind of second order utilitarian justice, anticipating the effects of first order utilitarian justice. Uh, and there's one other um, possible justification for non-consequentialist justice, and I think that uh, Josh alluded to it as well in his analogy of the camera that operates on uh, automatic. Namely, you may have to make room in your system of criminal justice for the brute fact of human nature that people will lose confidence in any system of criminal justice that doesn't at least in part satisfy a primitive need for uh, retribution. As Martin Daly and Margot Wilson note, in societies from every corner of the world, we can read of vows to avenge a slain father or brother and of rituals that sanctify those vows, of a mother raising her son to avenge a father who died in the avenger's infancy, of graveside vows, of drinking the deceased kinsman's blood as a covenant or keeping his bloody garment as a relic. So say that retribution in some measure is a legitimate rationale for criminal punishment in keeping the confidence of the mass, vast majority of citizens. Since police can't solve every crime, we can't have security cameras in every space in the entire society putting all of us under surveillance, a criminal justice system can only work if citizens believe it's fair by their own standards rooted in human nature. Otherwise, the system can devolve into uh, vigilante justice. Uh, as James Stephen, a uh, 19th century jurist, put it, the criminal law bears the same relation to the urge for revenge as marriage does to the sexual urge. Uh, so uh, if these remarks are uh, on the right track, then the four questions that I divided the question of the existence of free will into would have the following answer. Is there an I who controls my behavior independently of my brain? The answer is no. Is there a difference between knee-jerk reflexes and deliberate behavior? The answer is yes. Is my behavior predictable? Not entirely, but in some respects, at least probabilistically, or we hope so if we uh, hope to hold people responsi responsible. And can I ha be held responsible for my choices? The answer is yes. Okay, thank you to all of our speakers. Um, so the original format was to have uh, about five minutes for each of the speakers to kind of get their thoughts out on the table and maybe lay the ground for further kind of argumentation, but it does seem like there is already ample ground for conversation. So if it's okay with our speakers, we'll just launch straight into a kind of free discussion. And we did anticipate that Drs. Dennett and Green would kind of be at the heart of the, um, the debate, perhaps. So maybe with some light, I don't want to say moderation, but guidance from Dr. Pinker. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, Steve is just about right that what I was going to go on, my second point was going to be to develop very much the line that he developed about, about the consequentialist rationale for punishment. And punishment, that's punishment. It's not, it's, not, it's not rehabilitation, it's punishment. It's, the rationale is very simple. We're intentional systems. We have beliefs and desires. Our desires can be ranked. The most potent of our desires to stay alive, to be free, not to be in pain, not to be in suffering, can be harnessed by society uh, and turned into constraints on our behavior by being the threat. We're going to thwart your most deep desires unless you, unless you uh, follow the rules of society. Now, that, that idea of punishment is, I think, not... You can't jettison that from an idea of the rule of law. If you think the rule of law is important, I certainly do, then you have to accept that there's going to be Punishment, not just rehabilitation, but punishment. Um, think not of criminal law, think of, think of contract law. Um, if you sign a contract, basically you're making a promise, fancy, sign a contract. Suppose you don't keep your end of the bargain. Well, then you've got to pay a penalty, right? Well, what if you say, I'm not going to pay the penalty? Well, then further sanctions apply. You might go to jail. If you go to jail for not living up to your end of a contract, that's not rehabilitation, that's punishment. 
for just the reasons that, that Steve, Steve was characterizing there. Now, it looks to many people as if retributive theories of punishment and consequentialist theories of you know, what quasi-punishment, or you could call it punishment, but it looks like they're very different. And I want to show that along the lines that Steve was saying, that they're really not that different. Uh, on the one hand, there is sort of mad dog retributivism, but you know, forget that. <coughs> um, the, but the basic idea, as, as uh, uh, Josh has pointed out, of retributivism is that punishment is an end in itself. Independently of any good consequences for society, it is considered an end in itself. That's, as it were, definitional of, re of retributivism. But now look how close to that you can get consequentially. Suppose you think that, let's say, civilization, the pre preserving the civilization is an end in itself. Hard, hard to think of a more important thing to do than that. So suppose you think that civilization is an end in itself, and suppose that you think that the rule of law is a sine qua non of civilization, and suppose you think that punishment is a sine qua non of the rule of law. Then punishment is as close to being an end in itself as it could possibly be. If you can't have the one thing that is an end in itself unless you have this, then it's not some, some merely consequential reasoning. It is a very important bit of consequential reasoning. And this is, in fact, the way people reason, not always to good effect. They say, ah, we've got to keep this lifeboat afloat or we're all drowned. Then they say, well, unless I stay in charge of the lifeboat, it's not going to stay afloat. So my staying the captain of the lifeboat now becomes you know, an end in itself. Well, no, it's not an end in itself. But it might be the sine qua non of the thing that's most important. So I think that uh, if you think about oh, one little tiny thought experiment to bring home the point about punishment. Um, you're going to a concert in TD Garden. It's late. You're looking for a parking space. You can't find one. There's a no parking sign, a place that won't hurt anything. It's night. You park there, and you're just about to run off when a policeman comes up behind him and says, ah, no parking, no parking. It's against the law. And you say, yeah, 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 give me the $50 fine. He says, no. It doesn't say parking $50. <laughs> it says no parking. It's against the law. If you try not, if you try to, try to blow him off and go away, you are in for a lot more than a $50 fine. You're resisting arrest and all the rest because he's upholding the rule of law. This isn't a price of doing business. This is, this is a punishment. And it, one of the reasons that we... Uh, worry about the, the, the miscreants on Wall Street is that if they start viewing the fines as a, co a price of doing business, then this, this diminishes the respect for the law. And so uh, respect for the law, it, it sounds fusty, it sounds old fashioned, but in fact, there's deep consequential reasons why we want to preserve re uh, requests for the law. All you have to do is look at a failed state and you realize how important it is that we maintain respect for the law. And this is an arms race between, and, and, um, and both, I think, Steve and Josh got at this a little way. There's an arms race where in order to be respectable, the law has to have suitable excusing conditions. Otherwise, nobody will respect the law. But then people find loopholes in those, and then we have to adjust the law, and then they'll find loopholes in that. So there's a constant game of gaming the system and then changing the system so it can't be gamed in this way. But the upshot of all of that is, I think, that we have a system of punishment in place as the most uh, effective, least suffering, most secure way of preserving the things that really matter. Josh, thanks. <clears throat> thanks. Uh, <clears throat> and thank you, uh, Steve, for, for your clarification, uh, which was, as, as predicted, uh, <laughs> extremely helpful. Uh, I think what, what, I've, what I've heard is a very strong, compelling argument for punishment. What I've not heard is a strong, compelling argument for punishment that cannot be justified in consequentialist terms. That is for pure retribution. And maybe the conclusion of our debate is that we don't really disagree about anything in the end. But that is not 
if, if this is the position that we all agree on, it's not an empty position. It's not just common sense. And that's, I think, the, the, the more important point. So uh, when, when, as, I think, as Steve rightly pointed out, a lot of what may seem like pure retribution, uh, punishment for its own sake, can, through a kind of sophisticated, long-term, forward-thinking, consequentialist thinking, uh, be justified. And that's why in my little Venn diagram, most of it was covered. Uh, most, of, most of retributive punishment was covered by, by overlaps with consequentialist punishment. The point that I, I, I'd like to make, and I, I'd be curious to, to hear what Steve and Dan and others think about this is, is there that sliver on the right? And does it matter? That is, are there times when our policy really, really does, not just in a, not, 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 not just in a non-obvious way, but really does exceed what makes consequentialist sense? And that's what Michael Tonry is saying. Uh, this is the, the criminologist who I quoted, saying that there, for at least for a while, uh, the criminal justice system in the United States ha did get or has still been out of hand, where we've got our automatic settings, our taste for retribution, getting out ahead of what can be justified in consequentialist terms, and ahead of what can be justified by the farthest, longest thinking consequentialist thinking that, 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 that's available. And this is, this is, I think, where a mechanistic understanding of human nature can be, at least for some people, a kind of revelation. I think that the relationship between a mechanistic understanding and this shift in intuition is clearest when you think about cases like mental health. So you think about the woman, the, the mother of the soldier, who said, everyone's more forgiving when they understand that it's a brain problem and not a mind problem. Now, we all agree that the mind, at least the three of us up here, and I think a lot of you agree that the mind is a brain. But for a lot of people, for myself at a younger age, this was a kind of revelation. And it changed the way I thought about punishment. Not to say that you can't justify 90%, 95%, more than that of what we do, but that some of what we do may be very, very hard to justify. And what I'm claiming is something modest, but I think not empty, which is that understanding that human behavior, however complicated, however rich, however subtle it may be, understanding that it's purely mechanical does have an effect. And if we all understood that, our society wouldn't be turned upside down but it would be different in important ways. <clears throat> well, as one example of, uh, that might fall into that wedge of non-punished, um, possibly culpable behavior, someone who clearly deserves to be punished but we may choose not to punish, would be, say, Andre Breivik in uh, Norway, who, uh, those of you following the trial of the uh, Utoya shooter who uh, murdered 70 plus people uh, a year ago during the summer. Uh, there's a big debate in Norway as to whether he is sane or not. If he is sane, then uh, he will be, uh, the trial will go to completion, at which point he will surely be punished. If he is determined not to be sane, then ironically, he won't be punished. However, he will be locked up. Uh, in a closed psychiatric ward because he is a danger to himself and others. If, uh, and when that happens, there's, uh, as what happened in this country with John Hinckley 30 years ago, there's often a kind of moralistic outrage that uh, he got away with it. It led to this odd category of guilty but insane in the uh, aftermath where people are outraged at someone who clearly deserves punishment somehow gets away without it, even if, in fact, they are incapacitated. Uh, I don't know if that would fall into your category of, uh, say, an insa a successful insanity defense, together with protection of society against possible loose cannons by involuntary confinement would, would uh, be an example of that wedge. Interesting case. Yep. Um, I don't think there's that sliver where a retributive justification uh, which goes beyond any long-range consequentialist justification. I don't think I don't think there are any such cases. Really? Okay. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean that I don't believe in the concept of desert. I think those that get punished deserve. I think you can make perfectly good sense of desert without being a retributivist. I think there's a sort of consequentialist. And it's not, it's, it's, not a, it's not secret, it's not a surprise, it's quite, it's quite out there in the open. Um, it's there implicit when you sign that contract. Look, you signed that contract of your own free will. 
you knew the consequences, you knew the penalties, you've obtained benefit from this, now you've got to take your lumps. And by the way, I gave, I gave an interesting uh, challenge to some students of mine at Tufts recently. I'm teaching a course this semester on uh, artificial agents and autonomy, so we're doing robotics. And I set them the task of, all right, could you design a robot that could sign a contract? This is not, for, not as an agent of some other human being, but on its own, where you would sign a contract with that robot. In other words, let the robot make a promise. And when they think about it, they realize just piling on the, the uh, uh, rationality and the memory and all this, that's not enough. The robot has to have skin in the game. It's got to be punishable. And unless you somehow arrange for the robot to be able to suffer the consequences of breaking the promise, unless there's some way that you've got that, then you'd be an idiot to sign a contract with that robot. Did you want to respond to that? Otherwise, I have another. Um, well, it's interesting because, well, just as, as one brief thought, a lot of people think it makes sense that you could sign a contract with God. It's not clear that God would have skin in the game in that sense. But that's just a, a, a minor point. I think that... Uh, so much uh, the worse for that concept. So much for, for that concept. I, I just to briefly reiterate, I, I think that there, there's no, no denying that there is a sense in which we all must be responsible and punishable. The question is whether or not it's the only sense that's operative uh, in our society. Let me, let me throw out another example, and this is one, this is fairly common among moral, uh, among judicial theorists. Michael Sandel brings it up in his uh, class in, in Justice, of why uh, one might oppose a strictly consequentialist theory of justice. Namely, if the only goal of the judicial system is to minimize the amount of uh, wrongdoing, would we agree to some set of contingency, some policy that would do that, but that would deviate from our sense of justice. And in fact, the American imprisonment binge might be a good example, because it's uh, clear that, we, that a lot of people are in, in jail right now who really don't deserve the sentences given to them. The, they've committed some fairly minor crime for a third time, and they're locked away under three strikes and you're out, or they're nonviolent uh, drug dealers or drug possessors. But as a matter of fact, the crime rate uh, in the United States has plummeted since 1992, a few years after these draconian policies were in place, probably not, not completely because of deterrence, but probably in large part because of inca incapacitation. Uh, not only are a lot of people who have committed crime locked up in a place where they can't commit any more crimes, deterrence or not, they just can't do it, they're behind bars. But because statistically, social scientists have shown there are fairly good correlations between pretty much every category of wrongdoing. People who deal in drugs have a higher probability of getting involved in a violent fist fight. People who joyride cars, vandalize storefronts. It's not perfect predictability, but generally these pick out statistically a similar pool. So if you lock up petty drug dealers or turnstile jumpers and, and squeegee men and so on, you're going to reduce the rate of violent crime not because you're punishing people who deserve it, but because you are netting in the kind of, partly by accident, the kind of people who have a high probability of committing a crime. Now, in one way of thinking about it as a pure consequentialist, you could say, well, it doesn't matter whether you lock someone up for um, uh, mugging a little old lady or you lock a bunch of people up who never mugged a little old lady, but collectively they have a pretty good probability of doing so, and so you have the same reduction in the, in the number of little old ladies who get mugged. <laughs> now, to the extent that some intuition bridles at that, uh, that, that logic, one could carve out room for a notion of abstract justice, not to throw more, more people behind bars, but fewer, namely, we don't throw people behind bars to lower the crime rate, we throw people behind bars only if they deserve it. Would that be a... Well, I, I, the, the usual consequentialist move when one's uh, intuitions are bridles is to say, I'm, I'm not sure I accept the description of the consequences. That is, is that a long-term sustainable approach 
to, to, to criminal justice? Will it be found out that this is what's really going on? And what will people think about it when they find out what's going on? Is this something that we can do generation after generation, or is it just a temporary fix that will produce some really big benefits if we round up a lot of the bad types of people for reasons other than what we, 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 we say we're doing? So I, I'm, I'm not sure that I, I strongly suspect, but without you know, a, a clear mass, any kind of mastery of the evidence, that in the long, long run, this is not actually a consequential thing to do. But if if you could convince me that it was, then I, 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 would, I, would, I would have to accept it, uh, br bridled intuitions aside. Dan, do you want to make a comment, or should we open it to the audience? Why don't audience? we open it to the audience? OK, I think we have two microphones here. Can you line up at the microphone if you have a question for uh, any of us? My goodness. Mm. <laughs> Let's try to keep our answers real short. Yeah. Yes. I'm reminding myself, I always give too long answers. <laughs> yeah. Bob? Hi. If I may start by um, going before the prequel back to some sort of er prequel and go back. OK. I don't have a gavel for oh, you know, yeah. order. I'd like to go all the way back to the question, if I may, of free will. Um, I'd, I'd like to speak, if I can, I've written my little notes here. I'd like to speak for, for spooky kind of free will. And I was trying to think of, has anybody presented any evidence against the existence of spooky free will? And the closest we came was Steven Pinker talking about what, weighing the body after the death of an individual and trying to get the weight of the... Um, soul, which has never been successfully done, but I thought about taking my flashlight and weighing it on the most sensitive balance in the world and then turning it out on and letting all that light come out until the battery's dead and then weighing it again. And the weight would be the difference of the weight of the photons which have left the flashlight, which would never be measurable. So we would conclude from that experiment that there is no substance to light. And in fact, might conclude that light can't even really exist. I'd have to think about that some more. But I'd like this challenge. I mean, first of all, I'm one of those people who doesn't believe in free will. But I take that as a personal belief and not having any scientific um, reason for believing. I mean, we don't know yet of any scientific mechanism by which consciousness could exist. We have done yet no scientific experiments that demonstrate the existence of consciousness. And yet it does, which should remind us all that we've got this huge gap in our scientific knowledge. And it's a danger to assume that when we find those gaps, that we assume there's nothing on the other side of it. I mean, this is how we took out the hippocampi of of HM because we knew that they had no function. So, so what is the argument against consciousness, which we don't understand, even though it's been explained, um, consciousness which exists not, by the way, independent of the brain. I mean, if we have free will, it wouldn't be independent of the brain any more than our brain is independent of the body. Where is the real argument? that there's scientific evidence against free will in the spooky version. Dan, do you want to take that? Or? <laughs> well, He's not very a scientist. briefly, we have, I think, lots of good sound scientific reasons to believe that when you talk to people, when you give them evidence, and they take that into consideration, and they say they're doing it when they're being reflective, when they are responsive to that, th that this has a real effect. So we have, we have definite physical effects, and we've got an inkling of what the causation is. It's as complicated as all get out in the brain. But we see, that's why we educate people, because we do believe it works. We believe we put, put ideas into people's heads, and then these ideas guide their behavior, and so forth and so on. So we have, just leave spooky notions of consciousness aside for the moment. Let's just pretend for the sake of argument that we're zombies, that word sticks in my throat. Even if we're zombies, we have very good scientific evidence that zombies can be responsible because in their 
their stream of unconsciousness, they reflect in just the right ways so that they are deterrable in just the ways that, uh, uh, that Steve says. Yes. Oh, uh, Sorry, if I could just get a note in before we go to more questions. We do have, seem to have a lot of people who want to ask things, and we want to get to as many as possible. So if you could just keep them short, one or two sentences, we'd appreciate it. Speed dating. Yeah. Oh, uh, Professor Green, you had a very interesting uh, position that uh, in spite of the fact that we don't have free will, that we're Mr. Puppets, that we can still punish people, but uh, for consequentialist reasons, not for retributivist reasons. I had a question for uh, Professor Dennett, because at the one of your uh, first slides, you mentioned that that kind of compromise position where we acknowledge that people are Mr. Puppets, but we can still punish them for consequentialist reasons is actually an unstable kind of compromise. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that uh, position against uh, Professor Green. Well, first of all, I, I, I think it's a deep mistake to call them Mr. Puppet because the personification of a lifetime of causal interactions as a bunch of agents that are pulling the strings is it's just way out of bounds. There's all the difference in the world between somebody who's being controlled by another, another agent and one who's not being controlled by another agent. That's, it's intuitive and it has deep implications uh, in the way we treat people. Indeed, if we find out that somebody is under the control of another manipulating agent, we hold that, the, uh, the, the puppet, as it were, completely non-responsible and blame the other agent. There is a, a, I've called it the, uh, uh, well, never mind that. I'll stop right there. Okay, next. Uh, my question's for Professor Dennett. Um, first of all, I want to make sure I'm understanding you right. Uh, at the beginning of the discussion, you were talking about how if we view um, uh, the rule of law as an end in itself, um, then we might see that punishment, uh, whatever consequences it might have, is uh, constitutive of the rule of law. If we don't have it, we don't have the rule of law, so you don't have this thing that's an end in itself. Uh, am I understanding you right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so my question is, if somebody didn't think that the rule of law really was an end in itself, but it was just means toward personal freedom or personal rights or something along those lines, um, would that mean that punishment then in that uh, situation uh, wouldn't be an end in itself then, but it was just part of the whole mean system? What would you say in response to that person? Well, remember, actually what I said was that civilization I see. was an end in itself. Rule of law was a sine qua non for civilization. Okay. So what you're saying now is you're, you're talking about, that's what I meant by civilization. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, you've, most of the seminar has talked about the implications of punishment, et cetera, for under different conceptions of free will. Well, what about the concept of free will itself? Um, I don't believe in free will as uh, in the spooky type either. But here's the question. Uh, it seems to me that what we call free will is very much related to the concept of control, uh, perhaps more than deterrence, in my opinion. Or, um, uh, what does it mean to say? Is it sensible at all? What does it mean to say that a physical person, a person who is a physical being, can control? What does it mean to say that we control? That's my question. I, I think that that's a well-known, there's a well-known answer to that in control theory. And to say that one thing is in control of another or of itself is to say that there is a set of degrees of freedom and, and the, the controller can put the system that's being controlled into values of those degrees of freedom as it were at will. And so, I mean, control theory does suppose that there is there's one, in effect, agent that can do things in the world which drive some other part of the world into a state that the first system desires. So then self-control is just when you're doing it to yourself. And that's actually very different from other sorts of causation. It seems to me you're taking the easy way out uh, by concentrating on crime rather than sin. Because when you talk about crime and re retributivist punishment, it's sort of easy to think that you can stand back and uh, look at the issue from an impersonal point of view. And I don't think you can really uh, believe that people don't have free will or are not reasonable beings in personal relationships. Up to a point, there are situations where you can. You're negotiating with a, you know, a hostage taker. You seem to be reasoning, but you're really manipulating. So your, your model is one of impersonal manipulation. And perhaps if you looked at your personal relationships, not only retribution, but its opposite, 
praise that goes beyond manipulation, love, things like that, just the relationship of person to person. It seems to me you're acting as if our lives can be lived impersonally when they can't entirely. This is one, this is directed at me. Whoever wants it. <laughs> when is it? Uh, so I, I actually think that this distinction between one sort of ordinary private life and public policy is a very important one. Um, and an analogy I would make with another domain is, is the way we think about things in, in physics. So uh, you know, we, we, we've learned in, in, in the 20th century that space is not what we think it is intuitively. Time is not what we think it is intuitively. And when you're building a rocket ship to send into space, you really need to take into account the surprising features of, 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 of space and time that we've learned from modern physics. When you're navigating the aisles of the grocery store, uh, it makes sense to just practice as if the grocery store is a flatly Euclidean place. Uh, and, and, and that's fine and, and kind of inevitable. And I would say in the same way, when it comes to one's personal relationships, it, it makes perfect sense to go with our automatic settings, which I think are implicitly retributist in, 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 in certain ways. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what we want to do when we're deciding what the criminal justice system should be like. And to my mind, that's more akin to building a rocket ship and less like going to the grocery store. Sarah? This question is primarily but not exclusively directed at Professor Dennett. Um, so I, your description of, of sort of you know, this, this free will worth wanting um, I think is primarily based on the idea of you know, sort of having skin in the game, which seems to rely on this conscious illusion of having free will, right? There's not a ghost in the machine, but I feel like there is. Um, so then if we were talking about you know, a, a quote-unquote philosophical zombie or a, a robot that could maybe you know, come close to passing the Turing test, um, does it does it make sense to talk about free will in that instance, right? Where you you the thing that we're talking about acts as though it you know behaves in this consequentialist framework, but it doesn't actually have real desires. Oh, except that I would disagree, and I would say that a zombie or a, or a, or a robot that passed the Turing test could be a perfectly good agent with desires, and and for that matter, would be conscious. I think we're all mo moist robots. I don't think there's much doubt about that. The question is. Among moist robots, which ones have the moral competence to be justifiably held responsible for their deeds? Small children, no. Uh, existing robots, no. But, but I, I don't think having a control system that is an entirely physical thing and leaving indeterminism out, uh, I, don't, uh, uh, I don't think that disqualifies one for moral competence at all. Yes. Um, I just want to say that it's wonderful to have the three of you here. Well, thank you for the fascinating discussion. Uh, Professor Dennett, you brought up in your uh, presentation Sam Harris's book on free will, the recently published book. And I was just, um, I'm curious to hear uh, how your views differ. It's not so clear to me, and uh, if Professor Green or Professor Pinker, you have uh, you know, some, if you're familiar with his views, I'd be great to hear your perspectives as well. Well, Sam's, a, of course, a good friend of mine, and I, I read the book after it came out, and I didn't think it was right. I thought there were actually lots of things that were mistaken in it. I've started talking with him about it. We're going to, we'll do something where I articulate the things that I think he's, he's, he's missing. Uh, one of them is, is that cover. I think the, the, the I think that, and this is, this is not a new mistake, I think, but I think it's a very deep mistake. People say they slide from simple and pathological causation to causation overall and think that it's the same thing. The reason that we excuse people is not because their behavior is caused, but because it's caused in ways that, that are pathological. And if your behavior is caused by a well-informed and deep consideration of the very best reasons for behaving the way you're behaving and you're not deluded about anything, that's just fine. That's the way you want your behavior to be caused. Next. Yeah, all right, so going down the line, first Professor Green, um, going back to the uh, Venn diagram with the consequentialist and retributive types of punishment, um, was that, I, was, I just wanted to be sure, was that a, uh, was that about the goal of the person doing the punishment or the outcome? Because I think Professor Dennett said something which I agree with, which would be that anytime something bad happens to someone who's done something bad, that's going to have, like, especially in the long run, a consequentialist effect. So maybe you could make a very like, immediate, clear argument that the outcome, there's not going to be any sliver 
that is purely retributive, but are we talking about the goals with that Venn diagram rather than the outcome? I don't know if that was completely clear, or it wasn't necessarily clear to me. Um, so I think I understand your question. Well, what I would say, the idea is you can think of instances of punishment, cases in which one does or could punish someone for, for committing some transgression. And some subset, these were the ones that were in the blue circle on the left, can be justified in consequentialist terms. Sometimes it's, the justification is straightforward. Sometimes you have to think deep into the future about all of the long-term precedent setting and so on and so forth and, and symbolic and social effects of your action. But there's this set of punishments that ultimately are for the greater good. And then there's this other set of punishments that feel right. That's basically what I'm saying. So you can think of them as um, motivated by our, our retributive taste for punishment. And that, that's what the, 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 the little diagram is about. And as is the, the thing that I wanted to focus on was the right word sliver. That is stuff that feels intuitively right, but that even in, in our farthest reaching consequentialist thinking can't be justified in terms of the good effects that it has. So, so, wait, so it's all about thinking, it's not about uh, the actual outcome? You mean, when like you say on, the outcome, the meaning... Side, so you, like one could justify the outcome of some punishment by saying, or so someone could justify some punishment by saying like down the line this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that in the moment the person's doing it with that thought. Like I'm not punishing you oh, because I'm thinking about the future, right. even though right, I'm punishing you because I'm angry and feeling retributive. Right. So I don't know where that would be categorized. Yeah. And like so I think uh, Professor Pinker might have something to say about like evolution and game theory there. The stuff in the middle might be motivated by a desire for retribution, but can be, even if no one's actually thinking about it, justified in consequentialist terms. But wait, so but it, so it doesn't have to, it, the motivation doesn't have to be consequentialist for it to be in the blue circle. Okay. I'm going to go on to the next question. Um, in many ways, I am sort of a bit uh, incredulous that what has been brought up is this direct fine line separating a pathological conscious influence shaping someone and then a situational built up over time. And perhaps it sort of leads me to one thing which it might be a counterexample, and I'd sort of like to hear what the panel has to say on this. It is a mother who's pregnant who drinks alcohol, knowing it could potentially compromise her son, and then if he commits a murder thereafter, does that partially absolve him the way we don't blame Mr. Puppet because he was created by scientists? Is the mother a conscious scientist making an evil monster when she decides to drink when she's pregnant? So what's the dividing line? Uh, I'm really glad you asked that question because I, I think it, it plays into a number of arguments that have recently been made in the free will literature. First of all, I think intuitively we have a sense that if you make something that then goes out and does some harm, you're to some degree responsible, especially if you could foresee it. We've turned the drunk driving laws around. It used to be in my youth that people were excused for, for accidents because they were drunk. Poor devil didn't know what he was doing. Um, <laughs> Now we've turned it around. You're doubly culpable, and also the bartender who serves you the drink is culpable. This is, a, this is progress. This is a good thing. And the principle is that if you knowingly engage in behaviors which are, which are going to turn somebody, including yourself, into a menace of one sort or another, you can be held partly responsible for that. And I, so I think that, that um, uh, in a certain sense, we, we should... We should hold the mother morally responsible. I don't know whether we should make a law, but we should hold her morally responsible for her drinking, and we, and we should diminish the responsibility of the child as a result. Roman? So, I think you may have partially answered this, but this is primarily a question for Professor Dennett. It seems to me that one of the greatest contributions of Josh's argument is to just point out a piece of data, which is that the more we know about the external causes of people's behavior, the more we're likely to excuse that behavior. Um, and that seems to be intuitively true, and it, it can be experimentally validated as Josh has gone out and done. Um, but Josh has a very clear account of why this should be the case, right? Is that uh, everybody is mechanistic. We're not aware that everybody is mechanistic on an everyday intuitive level. And to the extent that it's pointed out to us that everybody is mechanistic, we become less and less retributivist because the source of our retributivist intuitions is really um, that, that assumption that people aren't mechanistic. So to the extent that you disagree with Josh, what is your account for... Um, for that, for that just piece of data, for the fact that our intuitions um, change as we understand the causes of people's behavior. Yeah, because yeah, I, I certainly think that the old French saying is just wrong. <laughs> and I'm not the only philosopher who's said that. John Austin famously said, no, that's wrong. Uh, the more you know, sometimes it adds contempt to, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, to uh, understanding. Um, something, he said something like that. Um, 
I think that the, if you want my shoot from the hip causal diagnosis of why people tend to believe that, including Josh here, it's because there is a huge bias regarding the cases where we actually do learn about the mechanistic causes. We learn about the, me the low-hanging fruit. We learn about the mechanistic causes when there's brain tumors, when there's drug addiction, when there's psychosis, and so forth. And those, of course, are all excusing conditions. Nobody's ever, I don't think I've ever seen anybody ever try to give a mechanistic account of um, Andrew Wiles um, uh, proving Fermat's last theorem. And if they ever did, I don't think people would say, well, geez, he's not responsible for that. Take away his prize. <laughs> we just never look at the cases where people's minds are, look, are working well. We just don't give mechanistic accounts of people's minds when they're in hunky-dory order. That's why the illusion is there that when, when we do see an explanation in terms of mechanism, we tend to excuse is because those are all cases of... of pathology of one degree or another. Josh? I, just, I, want to, I want to push Dan on this a little bit. So when you take, when you, when, so when we completely understand your typical responsible criminal and you look in silence of their brain, suppose we had perfect transparent yeah. access, uh -huh. right? And we, and we compare that person to their doppelganger who almost did it but it didn't. And we look and we see, aha, there's the moment when this neuron didn't quite fire as quick in this person, yep. whereas in this person it did. And then you want to say, and that's why that guy deserves to suffer, and that guy doesn't. Does that sound right to you? Well, actually, I discuss a very similar case, not a moral case, but a case uh, where we can actually look at the details now, where, where there's two chess programs playing against each other. And uh, one of them is always, A is always beating B, and we want to know why. What's, and it turns out A is just a much better chess player than B. And we, we imagine a case where, where there's a bit flipped. Mm -hmm. They both play the same game of chess up to the same moment. Right. Uh, a, the better player, when that moment castles right. and goes on to win. This is a deep move. Mm -hmm. B, at exactly the same moment, doesn't castle. Considers castling, but doesn't castle. And the difference is just in a single bit, you, you know, you switch a single bit and, and it, A doesn't castle or B doesn't castle. And, and in those cases, I, I say, we can say he could have done otherwise because it, 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 they're, just, they're just, as it were, at the, they are uh, beholden to a bit of chaos in the brain and we're all, our brains are designed to be holding, to be, as it were, hostage to chaos. And sure, sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you get unlucky, but if you are basically of sound mind, if you, if you, have, the, if you have the competence, then, then uh, those are the people to hold responsible because they're deterrable, as Steve says, uh, even though they weren't deterred on this occasion. So, so now I'd like to make it a retribution case. So instead of yep. chess playing machines, okay. let's talk about autonomous drones. Yeah. And we have one of these autonomous drones that is not quite as deep and as a result kills an innocent civilian, yep. right? Now do you want to say you've got these two drones, one's a little bit deeper than the other, or they're really similar design, but one just had a bit flipped and the other didn't. Do you want to say that now, not only can we say this one could have done otherwise and this one couldn't because it's deeper, this one's responsible and this one's not. Do you, do you want to say that we're getting closer to that autonomous drone deserves to be punished? deserves to suffer for what it did because it had the depth, but that bit was flipped and it missed it. Does a flip bit ever justify suffering? Well, we have to tell the story right. And we have to turn a few more knobs. So these have to be autonomous drones that are not, they are really autonomous drones. They're not under the control of anybody else. And they have had a moral education. <laughs> You got to tell the story that way, or otherwise it doesn't count. Why don't we just, just, just tell it, just tell it as, as far enough that it has what you think are the requ requisite. Because don't turn it into a person. Turn it into a well, machine I'm, that no, has what no, it needs to be. No, no. In fact, I'm going to turn it into a person, just not a human person. Okay. Because I, that's what a person is: is a responsible, is a responsible agent. And there's a, and there's a good reason for that. 
So, so I mean, I, I, I like your asking the question. And I think to ask it right takes a lot of knob turning. We have to add some more details uh, and take it out of the, the simple realm in which we're dealing with it. I'm going to use my prerogative as moderator to uh, violate the order of the queue. Um, everyone who has spoken this afternoon, save one, has had a certain trait in common. So I'm going to jump the queue and ask the woman uh, second in line on the right to ask a question. <laughs> I think I might be lacking another trait common in this room and that I am I'm a Roman Catholic actually. And I was um, wanted to thank you for this very um, interesting and also very amicable debate. I haven't noticed a great deal of opposition amongst you three in the audience. So I was wondering if for the sake of just broadening um, the intellectual scope of the discussion, if you would mind articulating, not in bugbear terms, but in sort of the strongest possible terms you can muster, the stance of some of the opponents you've encountered in these discussions about free will, especially the spooky kind. I'm sorry, I missed a key word. If I could articulate the... The stance, or the arguments of some of your opponents. The, the missing, the, the person who's missing from this table, who... Exactly. Oh, yes. I, I think that, uh, I think we had Tom Wolfe up on the uh, screen, and he might be a person who would articulate a position that, that, uh, that we haven't, namely that uh, if one were to eliminate the notion of free will and uncaused ca cause or uh, even spooky free will, then we would see the, in Nietzsche's terms, the total eclipse of all, vowel, of all values, not of all vowels. Uh, <laughs> That's your that would, be, that, that would be Bosnia, yes. Uh, <laughs> that, that, um, that without a, uh, uh, without a um, robust belief in free will, you could not have common assent to responsibility, that we might have highfalutin arguments from neuroscientists and philosophers on how, yeah, you can still have deterrence, but for the entire population to be on board with some notion of uh, responsibility, there has to be the idea that we're not puppets, uh, we're not moist robots, we are autonomous agents, and that that is the foundation of uh, civilization and decent behavior. Uh, I, I think that would be a I, I might add that th that quote from Tom Wolfe was from a piece called, Sorry, But Your Soul Just Died. <laughs> With that, I, I will uh, turn the mic over to our host. Um, so I think that's all we have time for. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers. <laughs>